new friends, not just with it, also to, to back up the friends from my other trips to Asia as well uh, during this year. So I've been given a bit of time. I'm sorry, I, I, I wanted not to delay your learning really because uh, I was tied up supporting a patient after the examination. Um, I will have some to eat later, I'm sure. Because eating is a very important thing, and that is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to divide my talk, I'm actually going to give two talks back to back. The first one is I'm going to talk more generally about swallowing therapy, and then the second one I'm going to talk about um, specifics of head and neck cancer rehabilitation. So, first of all, um, I think what's really important to bear in mind is that dysphagia costs money. And this systematic review was completed very recently, which showed the overall expenditure measured by monetary cost increased by over 40% in people diagnosed with oropharyngeal dysphagia versus their non-dysphagic counterparts. And also, people with dysphagia generally had two to eight days longer in hospital than their non-dysphagic counterparts. Now, if you multiply that by the number of people within your healthcare systems, within the laryngology head and neck system, that is a lot of time in hospital and potentially a lot of additional costs. And I think what I'd also add is it's not just the costs to us and the cost of the healthcare systems, it's the cost to the patients and their families. And having just spent time with a patient now uh, for the last hour or so, providing them with support and therapy, there is a lot of adjustment. The whole family was there trying to find the best way of supporting them. And I think what I would really urge people to do is not just see the person in front of you when you're dealing with dysphagia, think about that whole family unit. And as this work by my colleague Rebecca Nunn showed back in thinking about the radiation group, this, this family were in, the, in one room eating their Christmas dinners while the, the person who'd had the radiotherapy was alone drinking a milkshake in another room. Hmm? And then the reflection of the patient said, his wife skips dinner all the time now because she doesn't want to cook for just for one person. And we often hear about this, this guilt that relatives have uh, about uh, cooking and eating in front of their dysphagic partner. We've come a huge distance, but I think this diagram really does lay out what we did. This is from a uh, bit of work that we did uh, to develop a, a swallowing scale. There are two things that are important within pharyngeal swallowing. One is how safe is the swallowing? Is there aspiration? Is there penetration? Because if there is, it has the potential to lead to pneumonia. Secondly, is how efficient is the swallowing? And so some, I often get asked by doctors, are they aspirating? And I say, they're not. They say, great. But, if 75% of what you just tried to swallow is filling the molecular and the piriform sinuses, that is not someone who is going to get very well nourished. So we've got nutritional compromise. And then if you get nutritionally compromised, you get weaker. And potentially, you start having these problems. And if you have these problems, you get weaker. And you can end up with these problems. So you've got to think about this phase as not just being about aspiration. People are interested in aspiration, but it's not the only thing. So, the thing that I'm going to go on about quite regularly while I'm here this afternoon, and I feel very honoured to be here with you, is you need to do a rigorous multi-dimensional assessment. It's absolutely essential. Secondly, it's about person-centred care. There is no one-size-fits-all for someone presenting with dysphagia. It could be someone who's got a progressive neurological disease, has very different needs to the head and neck cancer patients. Someone who's had a stroke, there'll be a very different approach to rehabbing them versus perhaps someone who's been diagnosed with motor neuron disease, where the issues around rehabilitation, it's, it's about compensation, it's about supporting people as their di disease declines. It's about <coughs> therapeutic interventions, and most importantly, can I just have a show of hands, how many speech therapists are in the room? Any speech therapists? Go Any speech therapists? One, two, three with my green laser, four with my green laser. So we've got four speech therapists in the room, maybe five. How many dietitians are there? 
physiotherapists. So the issue that we I have, have seen... and we're going to come to this in a moment, and we need to follow people up regularly. So when we think about this case, this is a really yes, nice infographic about what I'm going to look at. You've got to take a good history. You've got to select the appropriate diagnostics. You've got to think about appropriate therapy for the person. And within that, there is a lot of education that goes on, which is what I've just been doing with the person I've been looking after in the other room. It's the emotional support as well, encouraging the family that if they're, if they're going to be anxious and worried, the patient's going to be anxious and worried, and about supporting them to better understand the problem. And I don't like the word compliance. I prefer the word adherence. Um, compliance is a sense of you need to do this. And of course, we're never saying that to our patients. It's about adherence and about how well they are able to stick to programs that we give them or recommendations we give them. But quite often, calling it compliance, these people go through a very, very difficult period in their lives. And uh, I'm sure we've all had healthcare conditions where our doctors have asked us to do something and we haven't done it. And that's just because of the way we're feeling. So if you imagine you're six weeks into radiotherapy and someone's telling you to do swallowing exercises, I think I'd struggle with that. And then we've got to think about, is it neurological with this failure? Is it mechanical? Is it iatrogenic? Is it systemic? And are there psychological factors? And I was struck yesterday by uh, the thought that we would send patients to psychologists and psychiatrists um, rather than to speech therapists, potentially, because speech therapists have a huge amount to offer in managing the psychosocial, the biopsychosocial model of care. And we integrate not only psychological tactics, but also what we know from our swallowing and our training to help people improve their swallowing function. So I think, um, bear in mind, if people have got psychological issues, quite often we can, we can talk to people about that as part of the speech therapy process. The other thing I just wanted to say is, therapy, this failure therapy, could be preventative. We know about preventative in terms of head and neck cancer, but there's some evidence as well that there may be benefit to, for example, esophageal cancers, preparing people who are going to undergo esophagectomies. There's restorative, which is probably what we're most used to, which is where we're targeting, for example, in stroke or in Parkinson's disease, specific elements of swallowing to get people swallowing better. Then there's supportive. So this might be that ongoing support and optimizing function who are left with a disability. Uh, thinking about people who have had stroke, maybe they've plateaued therapy-wise and they're not going to improve. And, and what we need to do is to keep supporting them and their families. And what I would also say is, well, just because a patient's had a stroke and has gone off to, um, uh, got, gone off and you think you're going to discharge them, it reminds me of a lady I went to go and see for a home visit. She had a peg tube and I got asked to go and review her about two years after she only just got back in touch with two years later. And I said, so how are you finding green ill by mouth? She goes, oh, it's, 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 I've got used to it now, I've got used to it, it's been two years. She said, but well, it's made easier by the fact that I eat fish and chips on Friday. And so she, she was eating fish and chips on a Friday, but having peg feeds the rest of the week. And of course, no one had monitored her, she'd improved. She'd worked out that she was getting better and kept on eating and drinking. So don't ever write someone off as never swallowing again. And most importantly, we have a role as speech and language therapists as part of the multidisciplinary team to support people to the end of life. And also some very simple interventions from a speech therapist in people's last days of life can be very comforting to the patient. And even if it's not comforting to the patient, we have a lot to offer the family in terms of supporting them to offer quality care to people as their relative uh, starts moving uh, into the dying phase. And I think that's really important. I went, used to work in hospices and see families. We all want to feed our loved ones when they're not well. And I used to see people pouring drinks down and patients coughing in bed. And sometimes just teaching a family to do really good mouth care 
was more valuable than actually and taking the emphasis away from this need to feed, explaining to them that this reduction in eating and drinking is part of the dying process and actually comfort's important. And we can have a role in that along with our nursing colleagues. So, things we've got to think about. We know that swallowing gets worse as we get older. We all don't, we don't jump out of bed as quickly as we did when we were in our teenage years. And we certainly don't swallow as well. And that's been shown in studies with people around the age of 80 and beyond. But also, we're not just thinking chronologically. There are some very, my mother is one. She's 83, she's in fantastic shape. But I'm sure we've all seen 60 year olds in clinic who look like they could be 80. And, but um, physiologically are operating at that level. We have to think about people's comorbidity as well. Um, quite often when we work in specialist hospitals, you may not have all the medical facts that you need. And quite often, if someone has forgotten to mention that someone's got Sjogren's syndrome, that could quite often be the missing piece when trying to explain why someone's reporting a swallowing difficulty. Be clear on what the patient's priorities are. Because sometimes what our priorities are as speech therapists or as laryngologists is not what the patient's priority is, and we need to respect that. Multidisciplinary working ourselves when we're showing that a few times, and there it is again. Absolutely critical to get a good outcome. Dietitians, physios. The advice I just gave to the patient, by the way, one of the patient I just saw, was use a compensatory strategy, brush your teeth three times a day, and she's got a loving family around her who are all doting on her. And I've instructed them to be her personal trainer and get her up and out and moving because there is a risk of aspiration. She needs to be clearing her chest. And being at home and beautifully looked after isn't always the answer. It needs to be a balance of the two. We've got to think holistically. How does this dysphagia fit into the person's life? And as I said, think about the support networks. If as a speech therapist I'm giving complex care to someone and they're going home on their own or they're socially isolated, they may not follow up. We know in the head and neck cancer literature that people who have families and strong support networks will live. People who are socially isolated, there's increased morbidity and mortality. And always shared decision making. An unwise decision that we perceive from a patient it's the right decision for that patient sometimes. We could only advise them and support them. So this is Professor Jerry Logan who passed away a few years ago now. I would say that she should be credited probably with saving the speech and language therapy profession when we were seen as an optional extra and the nice people who went around with picture cards helping people to say single words. She was the person who recognised that the skills that we had as speech therapists were directly applicable to swallowing. And I had the honour of meeting her several times. She's a wonderful woman, but I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I learned from her. Number one, if you change anyone's food texture, or you do anything to a drink to change it, to thicken it, you are having an immediate impact on their quality of life. The moment you change anything, so do not change things, try and find another way. If you've exhausted exercises and compensatory strategies, then start looking at changing foods. But don't make that the first thing you do if you can avoid it, because you're changing their quality of life. And the second thing is when you order a video philosophy, don't ask for a video philosophy or a fees to see if someone is aspirating. And the reason for that is, she proved that with four hours of training, anyone can tell if someone's aspirated on a video philosophy. The art is understanding the nature and the extent of the swallowing disorder, and most importantly, what we are going to do about it from the point of view of compensatory strategies and rehabilitation. So please remember, if nothing else from today's talk, please remember that. There have been some lovely papers. This one I would urge you to read in particular that's just been published in the last six months or uh, last three months actually from Maggie Lee Huckabee in New Zealand who has uh, basically sort of made us rethink our neurology of swallowing and the fact that 
the exercise armamentarium of her speech therapy is very much focused on strength exercises. But actually what she says is that we now need to start thinking about moving towards a skill-based model of care and actually helping people with biofeedback to better understand their swallowing, helping people with things like respiratory swallow therapy. Uh, there's, there, there's a lot going on in that field and I recommend that paper. And then this paper here by Rogi Martino from, um, from Toronto and Tim McCullough from Wisconsin highlights the fact that there's also neurostimulation that's going on, deep pharyngeal nerve stimulation at the moment, and also there are <coughs> surgical options. And again, um, I've been speaking to Dr. Tucker about this, you know, we need to work as a team to get the right outcome for people. Sometimes saying that you're going to just fix someone's cracopharyngeus and give them a dilatation, that's just one thing. I think sometimes it's only the one thing. You have to look at the swallowing in a hole. And very, sometimes they do, they come and you might have a UAS dysfunction as an isolated thing, but look at the rest of the swallow because quite often they've got a tongue-based weakness, epiglottic deflection issues, airway protection issues, so a dilatation alone is not going to work. You need to work in partnership with therapists to get a great outcome for patients. This is a very nice guideline as well from the German Society of Neurology. Uh, again, uh, gives some very nice, uh, I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time, but I would draw your attention to it. We've come up with 53 recommendations for the assessment and treatment of oropharyngeal dysphagia with people involved from 27 medical societies. And to give some idea about how things have come on, and I apologise for those who can't see this, but look at the We used to have a very limited range of exercises and offer in terms of rate, um, exercises for patients. But we've got a whole range of things. We've got neuromuscular uh, stimulation, we've got uh, bonus texture modification, TRP channel agonists, expiratory muscle strength training. Uh, Tuned up against resistance that our colleagues in Singapore have been developing, um, pharyngeal stimulation, all sorts of things. The, the range of things that we can offer is huge, but it's about selecting the right one. Uh, and this is a, an excellent paper if you're interested in looking at some of the advances in swallowing. And there's also been a move towards intensive swallowing therapy, and we need to think about the, the strength and skill training. So boot camp model of actually getting people to swallow and repeatedly swallow because uh, certainly in the UK now it used to be that when pe people go to the gym they just lift weights but actually does that mean that you're going to be able to lift the box as well so they've moved more into getting people to lift sandbags and pick them up and walk across gyms with sandbags and we should be doing the same thing with swallowing get people swallowing because that's what we want them to do getting them to bite their tongue and swallow it's not necessarily going to improve their swallowing in isolation. So boot camp approach is great. When we look at skill training, there's work from Body Martin Harris, Harris's group looking at respiratory um, coordination training, because for example, in the COPD population, people have a, a, a misalignment of res respiratory deglutition cycles, which means that they can end up aspirating secondary to that disordered pattern. In terms of strength training, we have a lot left to learn. We've got so much to do. Comprehensive swallowing evaluation should always be underpinned by a decent clinical swallowing evaluation by your speech therapist. There is no point in going straight to videophoroscopy or fees. Don't get me wrong, they're fantastic tools. But actually, if you talk to your speech therapist and you've got limited resource, you might pick the right one. I might continue to decide which one's the most appropriate in this case. But we also have emerging technologies in high resolution manometry, ultrasound, accelerometry. It's a very exciting time. I know we've had lectures this morning, but also we've got all phases of swallowing managed here by videophoroscopy, helps to assess the biomechanics. And then as you probably, I hope you enjoyed the fees demonstration, but also it's portable, you can use real food, you can look at secretions, you can spend the whole day scoping someone if you want to. I don't think the patient would be very pleased, but you don't have the limitations that you have with radiation. Uh, 
And you may need to infer what happened because you don't, during that whiteout period, you may not actually see what's happening structures wise. So the video philosophy allows you to see what happens mm. during the swallow. But most importantly, they both enable biofeedback, which I'm very keen on, which is why I rotated the chair to the screen, and also to trial therapeutic strategies. There is no point in just doing an examination saying, oh yeah, they're aspirating, that's it. You need to try and do something about it as well while you're in there. And that's a partnership between our speech therapists and our laryngology and head and neck colleagues. Always be sure what the purpose is of your examination. Always make sure it informs management. Don't just do a video philosophy for the sake of it. It's not just about aspiration. Is it actually going to change management? Now, I think it's really helpful for patients to know what's happening, but similarly, if they are not going to want to change, then they're going to say, I'm going to do whatever I want anyway, no matter what you tell me. I'll offer it to them as information, but just think, is it going to really change the management for this patient? Because as a limited resource, you need to see, is there somewhere else you might benefit? And maybe that person's not ready for change and they can come back again. Um, you also need to decide what you're going to use in terms of your intervention with patients. Um, if they're at the bedside, you're not going to be dragging them down to video philosophy necessarily. You can do a fees very nicely at the bedside. If someone's being ventilated on the ICU, fees is perfect. If someone can stand and follow commands and is very, very well and what have you, the philosophy is fantastic as well, but they tell you different things. They're complementary. They don't do one or the other. Either do them together as complementary, uh, or, or, to, or to, if you know specifically what you want from them. And also, don't always generalise. Just because you see a patient who's presenting like someone you've seen before, maybe they've got capacity for change. So do assess them. Whenever we're seeing people with swallowing difficulties, think about fatigue. We need to make our families aware if someone's falling asleep, that is not the time to be feeding them. Just because it fits with our meal times, does it fit with them? Should they be having a little often rather than big meals? Think about weakness and deconditioning. I quite often when I go to the ICU, Greek doctors will say, we haven't touched their throats. And I'll say, well, look at their legs. Look at their arms. Why are we expecting they're swallowing to function better than their arms and their legs when they've got critical care myopathy. It's all part of the same thing. So we just need to be very, very mindful. If people haven't got enough nutrition on board, there is no point in giving them exercises because they're not going to have anything to actually help build their muscles if they're so weak. So nutrition is important. And while we all want to try and avoid feeding tubes, sometimes they can be really helpful. They're not always the enemy. We need to think about how we can support people to get nutritionally complete so they can be good candidates. And things like xerostomia, I mentioned not, not only should but it's over the course with the case of radiation. People with mucositis, treatment-related mucositis is awful. We need to address that for people. And some people have just got thick phlegm. And as I think with a couple of the customers that we saw today, I think they probably hadn't had enough to drink a couple of them. They were dry. That's why all the food and drink was sticking on the insides of their throats. Final top tip for fees as well. If you're going to do a fees on someone who's finished radiotherapy recently, give them a glass of water first. Because the first bonus you give them, it'll just help to ease that uh, mucus off their walls and you're going to think, oh, they're aspirating. And actually, they're just clearing off this debris that's a result of the radiotherapy. So let them have a good clear out and a sip of water before you start the examination. Surgically, we've got lots of lovely interventions. Of course, local fold augmentation is really valuable. We've heard some lovely lectures about that over the last couple of days. Dilatation, uh, balloon dilatations to okay. help with UES opening. Uh, Botox can help. We use Botox with extreme caution. Laryngeal suspension. Also, I'm sure you've seen pharyngeal pouches when you get that backflow. The pouch fills to a point and then they get backflow to the peripheral fossae after a while and they aspirate second into that. I see some people who have a, a pouch that doesn't come back with um, material, doesn't come back through. Do they need the procedure? Are they managing? 
if when it starts back flowing up, that we, 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 we see you a surgeon or if the patient, regardless of that, is so uncomfortable. And also, ultimately, and sadly, what we're finding with a lot of patients now, post-radiation, is uh, the need for aspiration, eliminating laryngectomies, functional laryngectomies in people with late radiation. And also, in some neurological patients, where they'll select to have a narrow field laryngectomy. Oh, that's a good thing. Be holistic. <coughs> if you're trying to give someone exercises and they're worried about their finances, they are not going to be good candidates for rehab. What can we do? Can we connect them with a social worker who might be able to help them? If they're worried about their relationship, has someone spoken to them about their relationship? Will they help become a better candidate for rehab if that was the care? And one thing I just really wanted to highlight as well is sometimes people aren't ready for rehab. Some people need to go away and think about it before they come back. We've got some great adjuncts to therapy, fees, uh, tongue pressure manometers, respiratory muscle strength training, respiratory training, surface EMG, increasingly high resolution manometry, and uh, possible neuromuscular electrical stimulation. The jury's still out, it's not widely used, but there's been some success in the neurological population, but we have a lot to learn still. In terms of app-based solutions, there's particularly with patients, a lot of people have got smartphones now, and this is a lovely app that's come from uh, ISCJ, from uh, the uh, Amrita Institute in India, which is about swallowing exercises, and we've got something equivalent here, which was developed by my colleague Heather Starmer at Stanford University. Apps can be very, very helpful for people. When we're thinking about exercise, a couple of other things that we need to think about. First of all, what are the barriers to exercise? Sometimes people just don't know why on earth you've asked them to swallow a heart. Or why you've asked them to pull their tongues back. They don't know why they've been given. They can forget in the midst of everything else that's going on in their illness. They could be overwhelmed by a diagnosis. And they could have pain or fatigue. Things that help, and this is my colleague Gregory Govender from the University of College London is doing amazing work in behavioural change theory. Explain it to prevent negative consequences and it's not going to cause them harm. Help them know, to know how to do the exercises properly. Have a routine and say, you know, I always say to people, before you brush your teeth in the morning, do your exercises. And you better brush your teeth at night to do your exercises again at night. People are always going to be doing that. It's a good time for them to get in. Uh, and get some feedback. Everyone wants a pat on the back. We need to look after our patients and congratulate them when they're working hard and doing well. And don't just get support from the clinician. Think about supporting the family. I could spend the whole day talking about this, and particularly having listened to the lectures yesterday. In a complex laryngology clinic, in a non-malignant clinic, We've often got a lot of symptom overlap between all of these things. And we can have conflicting therapeutic goals with a lot of voice work, we're trying to calm the system down. With a lot of swallowing work, we're trying to strengthen things up. And when we've got, in the case of a lot of our patients in the laryngology clinic, who have a mixed picture, we need to be very mindful of the exercises that we're supporting and providing people with. And as I said when I was doing the fees examination, don't overcomplicate things. Try and keep it as simple as possible. So finally, I just want to talk about the importance of mouth care. We know that contaminated saliva, particularly in those people who are being fed uh, with a gastrostomy tube or a RAS tube, they are the people who are at greater risk. They can aspirate their saliva and that can cause uh, aspiration pneumonia. People who are dependent for oral care have decayed teeth, have a large number of medications, and are tube feeding, they are the ones at greatest risk of aspiration pneumonia, irrespective of their swallowing ability. So finally, I just want to say on this talk, this phase of rehabilitation is a continually emerging field. You have to be multidimensional when you're looking at therapy. You need to be person-centered. What do they want and how can we work with them? 
always include families and caregivers and make sure that we have shared decision making. And one of the things that I've heard from colleagues here during this conference and when I previously visited India is we don't have speech therapists. We heard it on the panel yesterday. We don't have speech therapists. And what I would say is I saw this lovely uh, poster up at the Tata Memorial when I was there earlier uh, at the end of last year. Your present circumstances don't determine where you can go, they merely determine where you can start. And I think I would actively encourage you. The health minister said last night, if there's anything I could do to help, let me know. So I would urge you to go and knock on his door and ask for some speech therapists who can start supporting you in your work. So that's the end of my first talk. Farhan, that's the end of my first talk. Have I got time to carry on quickly? Fifteen minutes. Thank you. Oh, that was a hard oh, that, what a kind guy. Thank you so much. I promise I'll do my best to get through it. I just want to talk about heavy net cam. Anyway, that was the first end of the first lecture. Any questions while I'm just changing my screen? No questions?